Hello, my name is Maria Sprouls and I am the Exhibitions and Programming Manager at Fotografiska New York. Fotografiska is a museum experience for the modern world. Founded in Stockholm in 2010, Fotografiska is a destination to discover world-class photography, eclectic programming, elevated dining, and surprising new perspectives. Guided by the mission to inspire a more conscious world through the power of photography, Fotografiska produces dynamic and unparalleled rotating exhibitions spanning various photographic genres in inclusive and immersive environments. With locations in Stockholm, New York City, and Tallinn, Fotografiska introduces new perspectives through different lenses from around the world. During the pandemic, we have come together both online and live in the museum for important discussions and dialogues around relevant and ever evolving topics. Tonight's online event is very special to me, and it's one of the resulting components of the partnership between Fotografiska New York and the Black Artist Fund, a nonprofit organization combating systemic inequity in art by providing grants to Black artists in the United States. To date, the Black Artist Fund has successfully administered over 80 grants to working artists throughout the country. It is the Black Artist Fund's mission to support the broadening of opportunities for Black cultural creatives while continuing to focus on delivering funds directly to Black artists. Today, we're pleased to present an evening with Michelle Dunmarsh, co-founder and publisher of Minor Matters Books, and BAF 2020 grantee Chanel Stone, Edward Cushenberry, and Kendall Vicente, who will discuss their work, the role of photography when it comes to its ability to capture loss, closeness, tenderness, safety, power, and to potentially discuss their experience of this past year that has been certainly a political loaded moment for this country. Now we're gonna show you some slides of the exhibition. For those in New York, please do visit us. We are at 281 Park Avenue South. And for the ones afar, um, we have a lot of content available online. So please tune in. Now, if we could have some slides of the show, that'd be great, okay. So tracking down intimacy is what you're seeing in these slideshows is our most recent installation at the museum, having opened February 17th and remaining on view through May 2nd on our sixth floor. It presents 14 carefully curated photographs by Chanel, Edward and Kendall who will be present tonight. And while organizing the show at the heart of its premise was to have intimacy as the backbone of it all. After months of everyone being apart, of being asked to social distance, we long for closeness and intimate encounters. And let me tell you that there's nothing more intimate than the encounter sometimes between a, a photographer and their subject, even when the subject is the own photographer. Chanel will tell us so much more about that. But we long for conversations, for shared silences, and for bearing witness to each other's existence. For many, for many of us, intimacy has been put on hold, and that has also meant that safety has been put on hold. Chanel Stone's self-portraiture series, Natura Negra, explores the renaturing of the Black body to the American landscape, placing herself at the center as a delicate monument, hinting at a long and complex history while standing present in the landscape that moves and changes around her. In her own words, guided by existential questions of being and belonging, I use self-portraiture to negotiate what it means to hold space as a Black body in the natural world. Edward Cushenberry series, While Nothing Lasts, is unafraid of fluorescent lights and skewed angles. He lays bare the joy and sorrow of everyday life by turning his camera on his friends and loved ones. Actually, the exhibition opens with a quote that stems from um, the essay that is in his book that is also on view in the show. And the quote is the following. It's by Oriana Corin, a photographer and writer herself. And it reads, we often think that with love comes intimacy, that intimacy is just a synonym for proximity, that if we are physically close to one another, often enough, that if we are intimate with that one another, Intimacy really is a practice in deep observation of those we love. And finally, Kendall Vicente's photography explores the complexities of Blackness, honoring the luminosity of each one of his subjects, highlighting the beauty, the strength, and the joy of the Black experience, seeking to instill self-love and confidence. Now, additionally, I would like to take a brief moment to welcome Michelle Dunmarsh to moderate this discussion. She was truly the best person to do so because she's a true believer in the discipline of photography. And I would also like to take the opportunity to mention that Michelle's soon to be published memoir, Seeing Being Seen, chronicles her life and her work as a book designer, as a cultural producer and a publisher. 
It is a glimpse of her life and her career for over the past 25 plus years. So we have left actually on the Vimeo chat for everybody to see. We have the portfolios of our of the participating artists and also to the memoir of Michelle. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you as personally and as visually as we can to our speakers tonight, Michelle Dunmarsh, Chanel Stone, Edward Cushenberry, and Kimbell Descent. Thank you for joining us tonight, guys. Hey, Maria, how's it going? It's going Thanks very so well. much, Maria. <clears throat> My pleasure. I leave you to it and I'll be back in a little bit, okay? Thank you, thank you. Well, it's so wonderful to be here, uh, to be to be virtually in New York. Kendall is actually in New York with us, but there's a few of us coming in from, from the West Coast. Um, and so welcome to everyone who is joining us this evening. We're so pleased to have you here. Uh, what Maria did not mention is that uh, she, also a practicing artist, was a student uh, at Parsons, and I have followed her work for the last decade, in including her curatorial work. So I'm so thrilled to be a part of this conversation this evening in celebrating the work that she has chosen to put forward uh, by Chanel, Edward and Kendall, who we'll hear from tonight. So congratulations to the three of you for this wonderful exhibition at Fotografiska. So what I'd like to do is ask each of you uh, to introduce yourselves briefly, just in your own words, tell us uh, where, where you're logging in from tonight and a little bit about you. And then we'll dive into your images um, and some conversation. So would anyone like to start? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, right. My name is Epic Cushenberry. I am in my friend's guest room because my internet's not good at my studio. I'm a photographer, painter, and drawer, originally from Orange County. It's good to have good friends with it internet solidity. Yeah, I'll go next. Hi, I'm Chanel Stone. I'm based in Oakland, California, and I'm originally from Los Angeles, and my work deals with the Black body's connection to the natural world and what it means to just be alive in a Black body. And I do a lot of work with self-portraiture. And I'm really excited to be here. It's great to have work up in New York, which is um, one of the cities in which I made um, quite a few images that's in the series that's on display um, here at Photographiska. Excellent, thanks, Chanel. Kendall? Can you talk a little louder, Kendall? Oh, I said, oh. Hi everyone, my name is Kendall Besson. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I am from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a film photographer. We're thrilled to have you all here tonight. And I'm logging in from Seattle, Washington, uh, a place where I grew up and then left at 18. Uh, and I have spent more time here in the last calendar year than I think I have since my senior year of high school. Um, so let's, let's start off with just sort of a, a broad uh, kind of topic, which very much ties into the theme of this exhibition and what brings the three of you together, which is this past year, uh, 2020. There are some amazing positive elements that have arisen out of it. There are some enormous uh, challenges. Um, I'll leave it at that. There are so many challenges, so we can decide which ones we want to want to dive into. So, can each of you just kind of speak for a moment? Let's let's hear about both what the last year has been like for you and and where you are now. Yeah, sure. I don't mind jumping into this one. So, yeah, 2020 was a very rough year for multiple reasons. It had some silver linings, of course, but um, it was challenging. It was, you know, a point in which the world kind of stood still for a moment and we were faced with many things, you know, uh, economically speaking, I think about the protests, so like racially driven lynchings that were occurring and then also the virus. It was three things at once and I definitely felt um, affected by each of those things um, for one, with the virus being the most present. Um, my mother got COVID during Christmas of last year. 
but luckily she is fine. But that was really intense. There was also the effects of the protests and how that impacted me. And then of course, um, being laid off and like having to rely on alternative incomes just to survive and being in the Bay, one of the most expensive areas of the country and like navigating that. I'm still recovering from many of those events from last year. And it really shaped my practice um, because I wasn't really making, I was focused on survival. So my whole thing that I did last year was mostly um, apply for grants you know, and like survive off of that, which was really interesting because 2020 proved that the funding has definitely been there this whole time in the art world. Like it was so many grants available. Um, I hope that that continues. But yeah, so I kind of like went more internal, did those things and like started to revisit my own artist archive and just kind of look at the things I had been making and like reimagining them in different ways. But it was a very, very, um, heavily politicized year, various things. Um, I'm curious to know how it affected others. Thank you, Chanel. Um, Kendall, Edward, do you wanna jump in on yeah, definitely. 2020? Definitely, so 2020, um, like Chanel said, it was a really trying year. However, it did have silver lines as well. 2020 started off for me um, as like a normal year came around to March. I lost my grandmother at the beginning of March. COVID hit the same day. Mm. Um, you know, the protests in the summer, school started back virtually. I ended up leaving school after a week after it started <laughs> and moved to New York in October in the midst of a pandemic. And I've been up here ever since. So a lot has happened. A lot has transpired. But I feel like it was a really transformative year for me. Yeah, you've had a lot of shifts and changes, and I hope we can bounce back to that and talk about that a little bit more. Thank you. Edward, anything to add to that from your experience? Oh, sorry, my internet kept things keep cutting out. Um, 2020, yeah, it, it caused a shift mostly in my approach to my work. A lot of my work is about my family, a lot of my work is about my friends. It made me, I haven't seen my dad in about, I think I saw him once or twice last year, which is rare because I'm usually seeing him once a month. It brought me closer to a lot of people in my life. It brought me closer to the things that are important to me. I went from always wanting to take photographs to just wanting to paint and draw all the time. and. It kind of, I don't know, made me want to be more present in the moment. I started a new relationship in 2020, right before COVID happened. And it just made me really focus on the things that are important to me and the people who are important to me. And my dad, luckily, nothing really bad happened. I think he's getting vaccinated because he is 85 or something like that. But it made me more present because every time I talk to him and tell him about my any kind of fears, anxiety, he'd be like, well, he was trying to be positive and be like, well, it could be worse, it could be worse. So it, it's still, it's a, it's, it was really a lot of ups and downs emotionally with everything going on. So it, for me, it, I found a new practice in painting and drawing and it brought me closer to a lot of my friends. And so yeah, that's, that's the impact of 2020. I love that all three of you have been able to, you know, really zero in on things that were were challenges, but also but also benefits. And um, for me, I've been feeling a lot of trauma since 2016, <laughs> and it feels like that just kind of continued to roll forward into 2020. So, to some extent, um, it was positive in that I felt like I was already in survival mode, and so this was an extension of survival mode, which I think you can, you can probably relate to. And, and that at different points in, in life, you know, I was looking back to 2001 and the challenges of 2001. And like, I talked to a friend of mine and said, I, I don't know if I'm like in denial or, uh, or if it's feeling like, okay, we just have to navigate this. And he said, well, in our lifetime, we've, we've lived through the AIDS epidemic. 
we've lived through multiple issues of, of racial trauma. Um, we've lived through 9-11. Um, if you haven't developed some coping skills at this point, I would be a little bit concerned about you. So it was a good reminder, you know, that um, these are moments that, that give us perspective. Um, and so I just, I do want to touch for a moment because of course you are all here as a result of the Black Artists Fund, uh, which developed out of, of 2020. And so can you just speak briefly before we then will dive into your work? Um, how did you learn about the Black Artists Fund? Um, what was your experience in applying in applying for grants? And at that moment, did you did you imagine that the end result would be uh, that one possible result would be that you would have this exhibition? Um, I think right after like, the pandemic started, I was looking for grants because I lost my job. And I was thinking, oh, now it's the time to fully jump into the art thing. And I'm not exactly sure how I applied, but I did, my Instagram's on private, or was on private. So I got a message and I was like, oh cool, who's this from? And it's like a Black Artist Fund. And I had to remember like when I applied to it. So that's how I found out that I, I got the grant, but I'm not really sure exactly how I found them out. I think there was this website that had nothing but artist grants and I was doing that five, six times a day, just trying to find something. Great, thank you, Edward. Chanel, yeah. can you? Yeah, likewise. It, it, it kind of, um, like, like what Kendall was saying, or, or sorry, like what Edward was saying, just applying to various grants and then just kind of seeing what came about. So it was kind of a surprise in a way, but I was extremely grateful for it. And I thought it was um, really awesome that it was um, dedicated to Black artists in particular and like really making sure there was some level of um, financial care that was present. So that came out of like a pivotal time. Like it, it was it was great. I didn't necessarily know an exhibition would come from it. I don't think that was necessarily a part of the grant. That was something that sparked because of it. But um, it was really great that the fund just existed in general. Um, like I said, in 2020, that's what kept a lot of artists and um, folks like us afloat essentially. So yeah. it was a really, really beautiful gesture. Thank you. I had an experience similar to Edward um, and Chanel where basically I was just applying to different grants. And one day I just happened to check my Instagram DMs and it was the Black Artist one. And it was like, we would love to grant you with, you know, so-and-so amount of money. And that came at a time where it was literally right before I moved, like a week before, I think. So <laughs> I was so grateful for that and for it to be an egg like an exhibit now for our work to be a part of something like in person. I don't think no one ever thought that would be like, that would come out of that, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity and for the exhibition. So thank you, Black Artists Fine and Photographista. It's, it's amazing. There, there were, as you've mentioned, there were a lot of grants uh, that sort of emerged to support creative people, to support artists. I also just want to um, acknowledge that many of the three of you have all spoken to, you know, making a decision in a difficult time to, to, to focus in, to continue to create, to make some life decisions, whether that's a, a move or to painting or just like, okay, I got to dial everything in here and really kind of focus in, in, in looking back at my work and seeing what I can do with this because it is one of the, the gifts of a creative life, right? That we always have richness in front of us, but it is difficult to see richness when you're not sure how to keep the roof over your head. You're not sure where the funds for the next month's bills are going to come from. Um, and so there there's, can sometimes be this sort of sense of like, oh, it's wonderful. You're a creative person. You've got all this great energy. It's like, but there's some basics within that. Um, that, that we need to survive. And when, when we have a little bit of a cushion on those things, it, it certainly makes, makes a big difference. Um, so Jordan, can we take a look at some images? Thank you. So for our audience, I have uh, just selected out of this beautiful, beautiful exhibition, I selected two images 
that really spoke to me by each of the artists. And I thought that would be a way for us to just kind of dive in a little bit to the work that you are each creating visually and how that relates to this notion of, of finding intimacy um, at, at a challenging period of time. So this first piece uh, is Fig 2018 by Chanel Stone. And I believe the two images I selected are both from the Natura Negra series. Is that correct, Chanel? Can we yeah. see the second image, please, Jordan? And then we'll bounce back to the first. Thank you. So these spoke to me in just visually very striking ways. And I wonder if you could speak for a moment, Chanel, you had written um, about this series, a kind of relationship between um, types of plants and thinking about uh, a migration from, from the South and places where your ancestors had time into where you grew up on the West Coast in California and now, uh, Southern California now up in Oakland. So can you talk a little bit about the physicality of your, your being and your body, in this case, interacting with what we would think of as the natural landscape, and then in, um, in search of a certain Eden, of course, a very different kind of landscape and plant life. Yeah, um, something that I look at in the work is this idea of being a Black American and um, a descendant of slaves, essentially, that there's this idea of not really having um, firm roots in any one place, just because like the history of my lineage beyond this country is really obscured. Like I probably will never really know. So the closest um, point of origin is like American South. And then me looking at what did it, what did it mean to grow up in LA where my grandparents and my great grandparents left um, the South in the, the early fifties to come to LA for a better life, to escape the Jim Crow South of this, you know, of that time. So, you know, I'm like a second generation Californian growing up in LA and how this relationship between the natural world and um, me is kind of fraught. And it's a very interesting um, association to it in the urban context versus my grandparents that grew up in a rural setting. And the American landscape was a very different um, understanding of what that could be. So I started to like work to subvert that idea and look at the, the landscape as um, also the, you know, the urban city, like there's plants just the same. Why can't this be considered a landscape just like um, the forefathers of photography that photographed the American West, right? And where do I lie in that as a black woman and in a black body when I've never been represented in this landscape outside of the context of slavery or, you know, lynchings and terror, you know, but there's all these histories that are present that just aren't brought to light for various reasons, uh, systematically usually hidden. So with this work, um, I'm traveling to different cities. So like this was made in Oakland, for instance, the other image was made in Brooklyn. And I'm kind of looking at the migratory patterns of um, black Americans from the South. Some went West, like my family did, some went to the East. And then also, yeah, as you mentioned the plants, it's like some of these plants traveled from other countries or just different parts of the country. Um, and just looking at that, but it's about connecting back to some sort of origin point. And for me, that's just returning to the natural world at any context. So I started to look at my own backyard in like the city, just because, you know, growing up, I didn't really have access to rural environments. And, you know, we didn't have the funds or the means to take vacations to national parks, you know, as a kid, or they were far away. It just wasn't accessible in that way. So just looking at what's around me in this, photograph that's shown right here. This is um, In Search of a Certain Eden. This is photographed in like Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And, you know, also unpacking the histories of these cities that are like historically black and have heritage here. And like by me being in this frame in the middle where you have to see and uh, reckon with me, it's kind of calling to the history of this land that's now being gentrified. It's like these histories are being erased and I'm a stand in for myself, but also um, collectively to represent something outside of myself. And the interesting thing about this photograph is that this plant is called, um, also known as a plantation lily. And I thought that was really interesting to tie it into that narrative of slavery that I just mentioned, like that is kind of the impetus behind me making this work in general is to like subvert these ideas that 
the only um, connection to the land as a Black American is through slavery. That's just not true. There's a history before and after slavery that isn't inherently just met with violence, you know? So I just found that as like a happy coincidence. I didn't know that that plant was called that. I see these all around Brooklyn. And, you know, the fact that it was blooming out of this tiny little square in the middle of this concrete courtyard in front of a public housing tenement that was like a tower, you know, it was like over a hundred stories tall. It's just the epitome of the city to me is like a tenement or like a, pro a projects or something, you know? So it's all of these things working here. And this plant is like a metaphor for resilience, like breaking out of your confines, like this particular neighborhood or this building was designed to just house people. It wasn't meant to be beautiful, quote unquote, or even be a place that one could thrive. It's just a place to like stack people on top of each other that are from a certain economic status. So I just wanted to show like the beauty in things that were not meant to be beautiful and how it's like recognizing this um, in the face of gentrification that has now come back to reclaim these areas. And obviously there was inherent value if it's being gentrified now. So there's so many things that I'm thinking about um, within the work when I'm, when I'm making them within the cities of Oakland. Yeah, there's Brooklyn, there's you know. a lot of a lot of layers to the history of, of every place, right? And I'm yeah. working on a project right now with a indigenous artist um, who is very engaged in the notion of what our sovereign nations who existed here before anyone else came here had the opportunity to, to own and their relationship to the land and, and how much that has changed. And yeah. so thinking about, you know, different waves of, of migration uh, populations, what, what our relationship is with the earth that we stand on, um, what we can own, what we can farm, what we can live on or in, and, and how those have shifted and changed uh, over time. So uh, Kendall and Edward, um, any thoughts or comments that you'd like to share? I know Kendall, you're a relatively recent plant transplant to Brooklyn. Um, and that environment is quite different, I would imagine, or maybe not. Do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, moving from Atlanta and, and coming into the environment in New York while we're, while we're here in Brooklyn with Chanel? So anyone who's ever been to the South, um, of course, you know, the landscape is totally different from the concrete and jungle, which is New York. So down there, it's kind of like the landscape and influences a lot. Like the landscape determines, if it makes sense, like nature is more so in control in this out. But in New York, we kind of, they kind of find a way to manipulate nature to build whatever they need to build around it. So one thing I really like about this picture, like she said, how the plant is kind of like blooming out of this, out of like in the middle of concrete. And I love how it kind of like she's become part of the plant, which in a sense she is. And yeah. Yeah, yeah I just love this of photo. The, with of the tree as well. And these kind of figures emerging, emerging out. But I love what you said about the, the, yes, the sense in New York of, of the control of nature. New York holds a lot of humanity's sense of control of a lot of things, whether, it, whether it's accurate or not, there is a perception um, of, of being in, in control. Yeah, before we started the chat, I was talking to Chanel about her time uh, receiving her English degree and how that relates to her work. And when she, man when she mentions that, she was inspired by the forefathers of, of photography. I could see a combination of a bit of poetry and Ansel Adams within her work. And it, it, I've never bothered to look at Ansel Adams' work because it, to me, is like very academic, but knowing that she has this English background and talking to her about living in LA, I like how she's making a connection to those three things in one photograph. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And going back to what um, Kendall said about like how the South is and then how, you know, New York is like in control of nature. It's really interesting because coming from LA to Brooklyn, 
it feels like nature is um, kind of taking over, at least in the summertime. Brooklyn is actually very green. So it's like, it still is a man-made environment, but it's interesting how these different cities look and feel um, when it comes to that intersection between the two. So yeah, um, I'm actually very eager to get to the South like proper and like make work there. So that way I can have like a holistic view of this land that we live on. But yeah, and thank you Edward for mentioning about the um, connection to like English or you know, just writing and poetry. That's something that I also am excited to um, dive further on, but it, it definitely does influence me specifically poetry um, in particular. Thanks, Janelle. Jordan, can we go on to Kendall's work? So these are both photographs um, that were made just in the last year. This is Brothers of Blood. And can we see the second and this is Nadine and Sasha. And these are both, they're, they're compositionally quite different and yet the gesture for me and, and the sense of skin and flesh um, and light in, in both of them was something that I was really Responding to, I was talking with Chanel a little bit earlier about a book that I was working on in 2020 of India Beale's uh, work. And the kinds of things that sometimes come up in the um, behind the scenes challenges in the world of photography are things like if you're printing, I was printing a book in Eastern Europe with people who I, I'm not there next to them to make sure that the colors are accurate. And so how someone understands what flesh should look like, what black flesh should look like. Um, and we got one set of proofs back and India said, I just wanna rub lotion on everybody. Like, this isn't right. Everybody looks ashy. And, and that was something that we understood to each other, but we, that's not an instruction you can give a printer. And so when I, was looking at your two photographs and that sense of skin and light and muscle um, and, and, and intimacy in that sense. Um, can you talk a little bit, because the light in this photograph is quite different than the light in the second photograph of Nadine and Sasha. Can, so can you talk a little bit about these two images and kind of your process in making them? Definitely. So this first image, Brothers of Blood, can you speak up just a little bit? Yes. Thank you. So this first image, Brothers of Blood, it's of two brothers. Their name is um, Amadou and Kareem. Um, and this was shot summer 2020. I believe I had just brought my uh, medium format camera and I kind of just wanted to create something that I've never done before. So I went to um, this place in Arabia and this place in Georgia is called Arabia Mountain. Um, we were by the water and I, this kind of like started um, my love for like water and just like capturing black people around water. Something about it is like really serene and just poetic to me. Um, but yeah, I had like this cool concept and I just wanted to just shoot something with them. Um, and I have always wanted to photograph them. So I just hit them up. I'm like, hey, I have this idea. Let's set it up. And I kind of just let them do what they wanted to do. I didn't really give a lot of direction. I just kind of just said, do like, I just wanted to capture their bond and like their chemistry with each other as brothers. And we were getting ready to leave and they were like hand in hand, well, shoulder or whatever this <laughs> position is called. And they were actually standing in water, I believe. And I was just like, wait, I really want to capture like a close up of this because it tells a message, it tells like a bond of brothers. So this is why I chose to like compose it like this. Um, and I love how it came out, of course, and the light, the way the light is hitting on their skin and everything to me, like their muscles, it just, it tells a lot in one picture. So yeah. of course. It's very visceral. Yeah. Really beautiful. I like the interlocking of the arms, like to kind of show this sense of like kinship and connection. And I actually really like the cool tint of this one, um, juxtaposed against the warmer image. Um, but yeah, definitely. Thank you. 
Well, and that limbs are moving, you know, we don't, we don't see um, anything that would traditionally be a part of a portrait, right? And every, everything's moving outside of the frame. And yet that cross, as Chanel pointed out, the, 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 the connection of those, of those arms being crossed with each other. Um, this is this and the, the relaxation of the shoulders. I think the subtlety of those postural elements um, really, really spoke to me. Uh, can we look at Nadine uh, and Sasha? Yes. I really love this image. Um, this image was also, sh I shot it summer of 2020. This was after Black is King came out, the film by Beyonce. And it was inspired by Brown Skin Girls, the video. Um, and I was really inspired by that video because it's very rare that you see Black people in those positions, like Black uh, debutantes. And I was like really intrigued by that. So I'm like, I would love to capture both. Like I was, I was saying to myself, like I would love to capture this or recreate this. So um, Sasha, she's a young model. She's like 16. I had never worked with her. She had reached out to me. I was like, wait, I would love to do that. Um, and Nadine, I put her into the shoot last minute um, because I just wanted, I wanted them to meet because Sasha was an up and coming model. And Nadine, she was already kind of, you know, getting her foot in there. Um, so they, I brought them both together and this is what we created. Um, and the reason I captured it like this where Sasha is looking directly at me and Nadine is kind of like resting her chin on Sasha's shoulder. Um, one, because of the design on the side of Nadine's head, I thought it was really cool. Um, but I love how intimate they look with each other. It's kind of like a big sister, little sister bond. And I love that I was able to capture that as well as like the matching gowns and the overall styling. And I love that they both had like low haircuts and everything. So it was, yeah, that was kind of like my thought process behind this image. Yeah, it's so interesting hearing your influence with uh, Black is King. That film, I watched that like at least four times. Like it was so <laughs> emotional, like I got teary eyed. So I definitely see the direct influence and something that I'm noticing it's really interesting is like in this one you have the two women interlocked and then the one before it's two men interlocked can you speak to that a bit like showing this bond between um these different folks in this way definitely so bonds is really important to me because with me I'm very close to my siblings so I love to capture family dynamics in my pictures um, and if I can't like, you know, find exact siblings, I'll try to recreate that bond in a picture. So that's why I tend to photograph in pairs and yeah, just to capture like different dynamics and stuff like that. I love the smile on your face, Kendall, when this photograph came up, like you were just beaming. I really love this picture. Well, it's, it's also, it's just a reminder sometimes that when I'm having conversations with photographers, you know what I, if you don't feel joy in it, if you're not happy with it, like why are the rest of us looking at it? Like you got to start from that place of like, yeah, you feel it. You're happy. You're happy with what you've, uh, with what you've captured, with what you've created. And, and so seeing your joy also brings, uh, brings more joy to, to anything we're seeing. When I was going through your website, <clears throat> I do like the fact that you make it a point to show to be on the black the way that the way that you said on your website, and I like looking at your work because I like seeing both the style and like both your style and how close you make people feel. And the first image, the one of the brothers interlocking, it kind of made me wish that I had a a more closer relationship with my brothers. But it did remind me growing up with my cousins and wanting to be close to them and going to Tennessee and just the idea of what it means to have male bonding or to be close to males in your life. I, I really resonate with the first photograph a lot. Yeah, and something I was thinking about, um, Kendall, is that you said you made these in 2020. 
Um, was this like during the protest, like when it was the heat of the protest or was this like the fall, like when in particular, but nonetheless, like it's beautiful that you made this when so much was like happening against um, black people during last year, you know? I made this image in the end of September, the first image, Brothers of Blood, that was made in the summer of 2020. So that was during the midst of the protest and everything like that. And I love that I created that during a time like that, just to show that, you know, like the strength, the love in our community or how we hold each other up during a time where the country was in despair. Um, but yeah, this image, um, Nadine and Sasha, like I said, it was created September, October, kind of like right before I moved. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to show love. Like that's all my work is like, I, I just love to capture love in my pictures in just different ways. So it's very important to me to capture that. Yeah, it's that's a wonderful transition into looking at Edward Edward's work. Jordan, can we move on to Edward's two images? Yep. So this is I Cherish My Sleep, which was a title and an image that really, really spoke to me. And if we can go to the second frame and then back to the first. Life is too long without her from 2016. Thank you. Edward, everything about this photograph really just caught me. The, the color, the composition, the gaze. Um, I teach courses on reading photographs and one of the things we have to start with is understanding our own, our own bias and what we bring to an image. Um, and so looking at this photograph and also looking at your title and thinking about the various reasons that we, that we lose sleep. Um, and certainly in the last year, there have been, there have been a lot of reasons of, of worry, of loss, of sadness, of isolation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about this, this image? Yeah, that's my friend Amadou. It was taken, so the majority of people in my book are friends from Art Center. Okay. So this was taken when I was working at Art Center and it was raining. And at that time I was shooting every single day and I forgot why Armandy texted me, but I saw him on his break and he was in his car and I like the way that it looked and it's like everything. So I just shot him, photographed him. And usually at the time when I photographed someone, I would ask him for a quote and he was telling me how finals was just keeping him awake and he just cherished his sleep. And I really liked the way that he said, the way that he said that. And I just like the fact that, that his face is the only thing that's lit up. And the way that I shoot is I underexpose my film four stops. So that's why everything's kind of thrown into shadows and why he is like popping up. The word angelic is really what first came to mind that there's um, which largely has to do with the light, the expression on his face could could go a lot of different directions, but the quality of, of light and the candor of that moment, I think speaking to um, the notion of intimacy as Maria had defined it of deep observation of those we love. Um, yeah. And this very much, I think falls into a very, a very intimate uh, moment. Can you speak a little bit about um, Life is Too Long Without Her from 2016? Yeah, that's my really good friend, AJ, who unfortunately lost his girlfriend. And that's the gravesite that he's, uh, that he's next to. And we went to visit her gravesite and I just photographed him. Um, like I said, I'm very thankful for my friend, friends because this project was very heavy for them because I photograph them every aspect of their life. And for me, it was how did I learn how to, how can I cope with these things going in my life? And when I see AJ and saw how strong he was and saw how reserved he was, it was something that 
I wanted to emulate in my life because I tend to take things really personally or used to, I'm getting better at it, but these heavy things were happening to my friends and they were just accepting it and still living. So Amadou and AJ and everyone, it was basically, here's how you cope with life. You can't, you can't really control the outcome, but you can control the effort. So yeah, yeah that photograph to me, it was a moment where he didn't have to have me there. And he didn't have to be okay with me photographing it, but he was. So it, it was a very, uh, all these photographs are very poignant mon- moments for me because it teaches me how to cope with life and teaches me that you're not in control, but you could work on your efforts. But what a gift also that you have friendships that allow you to be present and that you give your friends back the gift of your your presence i'm very thankful for my friends (laughs) yeah kendall that reminds me a little bit of something that you mentioned when we spoke earlier could you talk for a moment um am i understanding correctly that um and i'm not sure if we have the photograph here but that there is a photograph in the exhibition that was made uh the day that you learned that your grandmother passed away could you talk a little bit about that Yes. Ah, thank you. Um, this photograph right here, um, it was taken of my friend Amadou. Um, and this was after I had kind of took like a hiatus from photography. I took like a couple of months off because I didn't know like what direction I wanted to go in with photography. I was kind of just like stuck. Um, but one day I just hit up Amadou and I said, I would, I want to take pictures of you, you know? And my, I use my friends a lot to get re-inspired. So, of course, I wanted to photograph him because he's, like, he's, well, I mean, look at him. <laughs> so exactly. I want to photograph you. So I hit up my friend, Jordan, who made this custom do-rag that he's wearing, and it's lace. Yeah, but we did the photo shoot, and a couple of hours after the photo shoot, I found out my grandmother passed. And... It was kind of crazy because it's like I've had this amazing day where everything went perfect or so I thought. And then I met with such a down moment at the end of the day. But I really love this photo shoot in particular because of how it turned out. And it's really close to me because I did it the same day my grandmother passed. And now that I'm looking at it, it's kind of crazy how he's like wearing all white. And he has on like lace and you know a head covering and now that i think about it that's like it kind of ties to like purity and well so-called ties to purity and i don't know i just feel like it's kind of crazy that yeah well white is the color of mourning in many yeah. uh many cultures um so that yes there's such a strong presence and connection there. And I think those moments, I remember installing uh, this very major exhibition we did related to the history of the Black Panther Party. And I learned that morning that um, someone very dear had, had passed away. And it was, it was this, those will forever be tied as I'm sure this image will forever be, be tied for you. Um, but that's also part of the power of photography, right? Of that notion of a moment in time has been suspended. Right. And it's and like, we, when I look at this photograph, I I vividly remember that entire day, hmm. like step by step. So I think I'm so close to this photograph just because it's like the day I'll never forget. So I've just grown to love this photograph and this entire shoot. There's also another image that's not on here or it's not in the exhibition where Amadou, he's just like, it's like a blank stare into the camera. And it's actually one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. But yeah, it's like really poetic to me. So (laughs) yeah, I love this photo. Thank you. So as I was getting to know each of you virtually, remotely, since I don't get to also be in New York and see the exhibition, um, I I spent time looking at each each of your 
uh, Instagrams and also at your websites. And I will mm-hmm. say that a person of uh, my generation, I tend to read, visually read uh, a website. That's that's a space where I'm used to researching visual artists. Um, and I, I juried uh, a project with an 18 year old uh, woman in Los Angeles who had the opposite experience. Instagram is the space that she feels comfortable with. And um, so we had very different reads on photographers we were evaluating because she was looking at their Instagram page and making determinations from that. And I was looking at websites and it really broke down to a generational difference that she saw the Instagram pages of, of people over the age of 30 is like, oh no, this is not something I wanna look at. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, two questions for both of, for both of all of you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you present your work to the world, uh, particularly in a time where much of that is being as- accessed through a screen? And then can you talk about how you see work and where you find work that is either your understanding of the history of photography or contemporary practitioners that you're interested in? How, how do you discover work that continues to educate and inspire you? Yeah, I could uh, start with this. So I definitely feel like as a millennial, it's hybridized. So it's like some of this takes root in actual books, like artist books, looking at photo books of different photographers. It's the galleries, like gallery hopping. When I'm in New York, that's always a treat to be able to see the work. Or even home, being in the Bay, um, the museum is kind of like the first entry point. But then the hybridization comes in with the internet. It's like growing up on the internet. It's like looking at things through um, websites like Tumblr that used to be a way to see so many images. I mean, now we're kind of in the Instagram era and there's work there that I'm seeing from peers, but it's kind of like multiple things. It's not any one thing. And I think that's something that's so unique about being a millennial is like we're accessing things in very different visual languages and ways, but nonetheless, it's kind of like a holistic picture, but it isn't specifically just Instagram, you know what I mean? I think that might be like a misconception, but it's coming from uh, different avenues. And for me personally, I don't really post the work that I intend to show in a um, physical setting, like in a exhibition online. I just don't like to do that. I feel like I rather like reserve it for my website and then some of it on the website, but most of it's like something you have to see in person. Only because um, sometimes the internet is a weird void where it just gets lost or everyone starts creating something that's more homogenous because you're seeing the same thing over and over and over. So I try not to put like my personal work on there. That's more just like little experiments or something like that. Um, but that's just Good. me. Thank personally. you. Um, Kendall, yeah. Edward, can you jump in on that? Um, for me, it's because I do photography and trying illustration. It's Instagram because that's also how I sell my drawings and my paintings. Um, also, when I have issues with my website, to put more on Instagram. But the way I find work is friends, art shows, or just do like, various books, especially uh, artist books. And my friends finally borrow, or my friend, like, oh, have you seen this photographer? He's really cool. So it's like friends or Instagram or galleries. Thank you. Kendall, I'm conscious of time because I know Maria's got questions from our audience, but Kendall, can you weigh in quickly on that? Oh yeah, so starting off, of course it was like, it was Tumblr, Instagram, um, but as I got older, it started to transition to like galleries, um, photo books, I'm really enjoying photo books now. Um, Deanna Lawson is one, I really love her photo book and Nadia Lee, um, she's amazing. So yeah, it's kind of all, everything right now. So yeah, like Chanel said. Thank you. Well guys, thank you so much for that. We have a lot of comments and we have a few questions. First of all, um, Lauren says, an intimate conversation about photography. I love the way the moderator is creating a dialogue between the photographers about their work, which I agree. It was really beautiful to have this really round table happening in front of us. So I thank you for that. 
Um, I have a question. I organized them over here. Okay, so Charlie says, hi, beautiful work. Are the subjects people, he's speaking to Kendall, okay? Are subjects people that are found in the moment at the site or are they planned subjects? If planned, how do you find them? I know the answer to that, but you can say it. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It kind of like cut out. How do you find your subjects? Are they planned? Are they on site? How do you find them? Most of the times, the people in my pictures are my friends and family. Um, and yeah, if I do find people to shoot with, sometimes it's from Instagram, but most of the time it's my friends and family. Yeah, it's the ones close to you. I remember you, you told me that during our visit. Um, I have another question. Poetry has been mentioned multiple times in the conversation, and you all seem to operate powerfully on the thin line between a poetic approach to image and the documentary and qualities of photography. In our time of urgency for social justice and racial equality, what do you think can be the role of beauty in this artistic research? Good question. Oh, yeah, I like that question a lot. I feel like beauty is an interesting way to um, an access point into the work. On the surface, it may appear like aesthetically pleasing and beautiful, but beyond that, there's more layers there. And I think that's important to remember, like it can be a tool to like bring you in, but then there's more. And sometimes we get caught up on like the surface, but there's so much happening underneath that. So I definitely use it in that way. Fantastic. And it's really reflected with, with the lusciousness of your images. There's always something behind. There's always something in front of your images, Chanel, but there's always something behind. Like we speak so much about, the, the chance element, like the dog walking thereby and the beautiful interview that you did with NPR, I, I, I loved and I found it so profound that you said, I photographed in this space, my grandmother's yard because of the yellow, because of the elements, but because I feel safe. And that is a layer that it goes beyond beauty because safety in itself shall be beautiful. So thank you for that answer. But I think there's also a space, Maria, where there is an assumption about what um work around social justice looks like that's true absolutely what i really appreciate about the three photographers and artists who are here is that you are making statements in your work you are making statements of joy you are making statements of connection you're making statements of intimacy you're making connections of strength uh, in certainly in, in all of your work but particularly chanel and in, in edward and in, in how you confront difficulty and find strength and find beauty. And that part of that is within our world of photography to be open to what people are creating, what our practitioners are saying to us, that it's our job to receive their work and to learn what we need to learn to receive it, rather than saying, these are the categories that I'm used to, this one doesn't fit in the way that I expected. Right. So continuing for us as viewers to open, open our minds to the totality of the work. Absolutely. Um, I have another question from the chat. Um, does your childhood has had an impact on your photography themes? How does your childhood impact that? Is there anybody? In 30 seconds or less. Go. <laughs> I can definitely speak on this. Um, so in my childhood, of course, we all deal with childhood trauma. Um, me, particularly, being my parents' divorce. So in a lot of my pictures, I try to show kind of what I didn't see as a child, if that makes sense. That's why I capture love and just family dynamics in a way. I actually have a portrait series called The Family Portraits I Never Had. Um, and I'm photographing basically Black families who never had the opportunity to have a family portrait because of a divorce, because of separation, because of a death in their immediate family. So, yeah, so my childhood, it plays a lot into my work now. Like, honestly, it inspired me to create what I create, so, yeah. Uh, as for me, my dad is one of the most important person, like one of the most important person in my life. and. He was the first positive male role model that I had. He taught me how to question authority. He taught me to question religion. And he was a very, when I was growing up, he was a very like 
caring but very strict disciplinarian. And to have the roles reverse where I saw him deteriorate and I saw him getting weaker and I had to take care of him. Like I had to clean him. Sometimes I had to, you know, when he got really bad, I had to like change him. It really destroyed the image that I had of my dad when I was younger. And I didn't know how to cope with it. So when I photographed him, it's me trying to go back to me feeling safe with him because he sacrificed a lot of his happiness and a lot of his dreams to make sure that I had what I needed. So when it comes to my dad, that's the only childhood thing I have is just me so see me wanting me honestly wanting to see my dad the way I saw him when I was when I was 12 or 13 and not being able to cope with the fact that I have to it's it's not the same anymore. So that's the only childhood thing that I have really that influences my work. It's just my dad. Thank you for sharing that. He's so ever present that thank you for sharing that Edward. We don't have to go at eight on the dot. We have more questions guys. Is that okay with you? Yeah 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 okay so Kendall what do you want to express or say in your photographs how do you actually get this is long (laughs) how do you actually get your photographs to say that so a major theme of my work is self-love and confidence and I always say when I want black people to look at my work and know they're beautiful they're strong they're loved no matter what the world says so I try to I make I make it a point for my pictures to communicate that no matter what I photograph the way I do that is kind of just natural like I I don't I don't give direction to know when I take photos with like it's really crazy I kind of just I'm more of a go I'm like go with the flow kind of person so when I'm creating a picture, I just let everything flow. And honestly, it just comes. It just comes out. That's all I can say. It's really nothing I do. It just kind of develops, literally. Well, it's fantastic that you get to have people in front of your camera that you're not giving any direction. And they they want to be close to each other, that they want to lean into each other. That That is really something. And not using each other as a shield, but really coming forward together in power. So that comes across in your image. I actually totally believe it. Um, we have more. Chanel, do you find the history of Oakland past and present inspiring? If so, what have you created in that city that reflects that? Yeah, definitely. I feel like moving to Oakland, um, so I've been here about like three and a half years now. It just made me in touch with my blackness. Like it's a historically black city. The Black Panthers started here. There's so much history with like um, civil rights, et cetera, and it's continued. It's just a legacy. It's just in the fiber of the city. So by me reconnecting with this sense of identity on a um, cultural level, it inspired me to make the work I'm doing now because it it started there. And then it kind of like really took bloom in New York. And then I kind of went back to LA to like connect the dots. But yeah, just focusing in on my identity, like as a black woman, that is a direct derivative from living in Oakland, 100% going to the genesis of it all and going to it strongly and yeah gra- grabbing it grabbing the bull by the by the horns yeah and being unapologetic about it definitely yes unapologetic that's that's the correct word um how has the last year changed how you approach documenting intimacy to the three of you uh it has made it very more much more intentional. Yeah. So, because I, I don't see that many people as often. And, you know, even today, before I came to my friend's house, I debated if I should bring my camera or not because I wasn't sure if it was worth it. So, the stuff that I shot over the pandemic is, is this worth to shoot? Should I just spend time with them instead of shooting? So, like I said, the only couple of times I saw my dad, it was on his birthday and I was going to photograph him, but I was saying to myself, I am not going to see my dad again for another like few months. And I'd rather just photograph, I'd rather just spend time with him than photograph him. So it's, it makes me more, I don't know, I don't feel the need to shoot. And 
for me being close it's like i'd rather spend time with this person so yeah. I, I i i haven't felt a desire to shoot because i'm not sure when i want to see a friend again and i'd rather uh hang out with them than photograph them and photograph them that makes sense yeah okay mm. Question for Edward, what does your photography practice do that your paintings and drawings do not or vice versa? Uh, the paintings and drawing, uh, the photography is what's happening in my friend's life. It's, what hap it's just what, it's what's happening now. The paintings and drawings are a little bit more humorous and it's my interpretation or romanticism or uh, of the absurdity that I think that I should talk about. Um, basically, the photographs are realism and the paintings and drawings are romanticism. Um, they do different things. The photography talks about my intimate relationships with my friends and my dad. My paintings might talk about my political beliefs or I might talk about something that's super far out. It's more freedom in paintings. Um, I'm not relying on light or relying on people's availability or availability. Sure. yeah so um the paintings allow me to be more free and more not necessarily more happy but more carefree and joyous and to just be absurd where the photography it's sometimes depending on the moment it might be super serious yeah so i, I felt more free when i paint and draw beautiful well that was a great answer and I think I have a last one. Okay. Um, oh my God. No, there's so many, but <laughs> Kendall's work reminded me of fashion photography at times and Edwards was very cinematic. Are you thinking about the work being seen in fine art context or are you inspired by works outside of the fine art photography? Uh, is that to both? To both cinema oh. <laughs> for you and very fashion photography for Kendall. Um, for me, it took me a long time to be very honest with myself and my work that it wasn't going to be commercially viable mm -hmm. and that it wasn't going to be editorial viable. So um, what made me go on a fine track art to, to be more honest with myself was in 2017, I was very fortunate that my really, really good friend, Hiroshi Clark, who is an awesome photographer, gave me a show at USC and a solo show at USC. And when I put all the work up, it kind of clicked with like, okay, I need to find some other way to make a living because it's not going to be the traditional commercial right with photography. And not to put myself down, but it was more like this belong, this, you're a fine art photographer, you're a documentary photographer, you should stop pursuing commercial jobs or stop getting mad that you're not getting hired for commercial jobs because that's not what you, this is not what these photographs are. So for me, it's about, I care more about myself being in books and on walls. So which is the reason why I focus on painting and drawing because it allows me to have a living and allows me to, sh to keep the photography in books. So I'm more, I guess, more of a fine art photographer. If that makes sense, this is the first, like second show I've had with my photographs. So yeah, I like the idea of being a fine art photographer. Well, it's a pleasure. You have, you have, a, you have a monograph, which has huh? been yeah. mentioned that you have a book, which hopefully has been mentioned in the chat somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's available for purchase in our store. You guys can buy it online as well. It's published beautifully by Candor Arts, who are based in Chicago. And everything I've heard from Edward, he says that it has been a pleasure to work with them. It's a gorgeous publication. It's on view in the installation. And it's also available here. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for everything. I think that we are going to have to go. OK. <laughs> but it, it, it has been such a treat to have you and thank you so much for your honesty for speaking of your bravery for speaking of how transformative this year has been and for speaking about your fears and also about how you, your resilience like I can totally tell it by your imagery and by the way you have come forward both in private talks we've held and now right now in public thank you all I want to thank um the Black Artist Fund of course we have been uh, so thank much you so much they have been such a pleasure to work with. Uh, Claudia Eng, Kareem Stanley, all their voting committee, they have been such a delight. And they are 
one of the reasons why Fotografiska thought it was really imminent to partner with them is because they're a very young organization, if you think about it. And they have been doing so much work. I really thank them for having partnered with us. I thank my colleagues at the museum, of course. And I thank you all. Thank you for being part of, of, this, of this beautiful installation that really... Very thank happy. you so much. No, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> See you all soon. And See you soon. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody who joined us too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right.